Welcome. I'm Julie Thompson, Executive Director of PAC TV, and today we're hosting a COVID-19 update for the town of Pembroke. We're hosting these forums every Tuesday and Thursday at 9 a.m. Watch in Pembroke on Comcast Channel 15 or online on our streaming channel by visiting pactv.org slash live. To ask questions during the forum, email them to pembrokeinfo at pactv.org. For the forum replay schedule and additional Pembroke meeting coverage, please visit pactv.org slash Pembroke. Sabrina Chilcott, Pembroke's Assistant Town Manager, will moderate the forum and will introduce the participants who are contributing today. Welcome, Sabrina. Take a moment now at the top of the forum just to introduce today's, uh, today's participants and thank them very much for taking time out of their day to join. Um, as we've been seeing every Thursday, Health Agent Lisa Cullity is with us, Deputy Chief Ken McCormick from the fire department is with us. Hello. We've managed to uh, grab uh, police chief Richard Wall. Good morning, Chief Wall. Good and, morning. Uh, thank you. And uh, we also have Selectman Dan Trabuco and State, Repres State Representative Josh Cutler. Good morning, morning, everyone, and thank you. All right, so to start, we're going to roll around a bit and talk about what <clears throat> we've seen, you've seen out there as changes from when we all gathered last week. Uh, there's been some new news, there's been a lot of waiting, there's been a lot of uh, concern about where we're about to go. And just from your perspective from last Thursday to today, what kinds of changes have you seen, if any, within your departments? And Chief Wall, we'd love to start with you. Well, I think that, uh, you know, we all got to take this seriously. It's <clears throat> a stay-at-home situation. You're shopping, don't go for one item. Make it important when you go, go get everything you need and hopefully you don't have to go for another week. If you have some uh, seniors that live down the, down the street from you or, or family members, see if you can combine their shopping with yours so they don't have to get exposed when they go out. And we have less people in the stores and there's been some new regulations that Lisa will talk to about uh, keeping people safe social distance wise in the stores and, and outside. And that's basically the changes. I mean, we're getting to that to that peak and we really have to buckle down and just, just stay the course. Thank you, Lisa. To Chief's point, what are some of the changes that we've heard about and they're starting to be implemented in places like grocery stores, which are essential? Sure. So the biggest change we see is that the governor's order has limited stores to 40% of their capacity, meaning whatever their population was allowed before, they're now allowed less than half of that. Um, this is a good thing. What we don't want is people um, getting on top of each other because they are all trying to shop at the same time. If you have the opportunity to, to shop at a non-peak time, um, please do so, whether that be early morning or later in the evening before the store closes. I also found personally, I'm having success middle of the day, that one o'clock-ish thing. I'm using my lunch um, to, to get items, and I'm finding there's very few people in the stores at those times. That's wonderful. You're also going to notice the stores have all implemented one-directional aisles. This is really important, again, so that people don't end up head-on and coming close to each other unnecessarily. Um, so you want to try to follow that as much as you're capable. You do want to social distance even when in the store. Some of the positive things I'm noticing is that people do seem to be taking this seriously. Um, I'm going to say about 60% of the people I'm encountering in a grocery store, maybe even a little higher, are now wearing facial coverings of some kind, which is great. Um, people are using the sanitizer um, when it's available. They're using the hand wipes when that's available. And I'm observing an awful lot of that. So that's, that's really wonderful to see. And those things are going to be really positive. Got it. Thank you. And uh, Ken, question for you. The fire department has been conducting routine business, going out on fires, going out on EMS calls. What kinds of uh, uptick, or if any, have you seen, and what are you expecting to see over the next week before we get together again? Well, we have actually seen an uptick in medical calls. I think it has to do with people that have been in that last that week and a half of asymptomatic are now becoming symptomatic. Um, the flu, the the allergies are out there right now. I think that has a little bit to do with it. So our, our call volume has gone up a little bit um, where it was kind of, it was steady, but flat for a little bit. People didn't want to go to the hospital. They were afraid to go to the hospital. Uh, so they were staying home a little longer. Um, that's just about 
what we've been doing with the medical calls. Everything else is still business as normal. Um, you know, we're taking all our bad precautions still. You know, I, I could just reiterate what uh, Lisa and, and the chief said. We put a lot of time and energy into this to do, get where we are now. So we need to just continue that for a little bit longer. Uh, you know, we got to suck it up, stay home, and hopefully this will pass and we'll be able to move on with our uh, normal lives or as normal as we can be. But we just got to put a little bit more effort into it. As a follow-up to that, are you sending everyone out on every call fully equipped? How are the PPEs working over in your department? So our call, the way we handle calls has changed. Our response hasn't. We're still sending a truck and an engine, uh, an ambulance to medicals. Uh, we're just not committing everybody into the house unless we need to. Uh, one guy dresses up in uh, a mask. He goes in, he checks, sees what the situation is. He then comes out and tells his crew what he needs, if he's all set. Uh, if we could have our, our patients walk out to the ambulance, we're doing that. We're giving them a mask and having them kind of do a lot of the things on their own if they're capable. Um, you know, we're just trying to limit our exposure. As I've said before, it only takes one or two of us, and then the quarter of the department is gone. Uh, and we'll have, we have to kind of do what the chief said. We'll have to figure out how to get our off-duty you know, crews in or our call department in. So we're just trying to isolate ourselves do the best we can. We can't ask other people to do things and, and have us not do the same. So we're wearing masks now on every call, um, whether they're procedural masks or N95s, depending on the call. Uh, so we've, we've taken that step. Okay, and I, to, to follow up on that point, sorry, how about uh, what's the plan? I mean, are you able to go into any detail on what happens if you wind up with a, you know, a, a firefighter or an EMT? who tests positive for the virus? Are you staggering shifts? Is there a protocol in place? We don't have the ability, like the somewhat like the police and the, and the DPW to stagger shifts or have people off a week and on a week. Um, so that's why we've limited the crew entry to one individual. And he'll determine what we need to do at that particular point. Um, you know, we're social distance inside the station. We don't eat lunch all together or we stay separate there. So in our building small. So we've, we've learned to adapt to do that. Uh, if one of our guys, as the chief said, if one of our guys is either believes he's been contaminated or is contaminated with a fluid, um, he goes, he gets tested. We send him up to the first responder test site. You know, he stays out until that test comes back, either in the negative or the affirmative. And then we take the steps after that. Knock on wood, we've been good so far. Excellent. Good, good. Chief, just as a point for you, how have you, you know, aligned your personnel on shifts and responses just to make sure you can minimize on your side? Well, Sabrina, the, the first thing that, that we've asked people when they, even when they call in is, is we ask them the questions, if somebody's sick at their house, if they have any flu-like symptoms to give the offices. And then if it's a medical to give the fire department a heads up, uh, you're going to notice that our officers are wearing procedural masks now when they get out of the car, when they go into any, any building or uh, any house. And we're going to suggest to the people that we go, if we have to go in the house, that they also wear some kind of a, a facial covering to help protect our officers. Um, right now, we're, we're doing okay. And, and we're, you're again, practicing mm -hmm. social distancing, practicing washing hands, doing all the things that we're telling everybody to do. The officers do probably 10 times as much every call. Every time they get in out of the car, they're taking care of that. And, and hopefully we don't lose people. Uh, and, and again, we've had a few that have gone down to get tested um, out of, you know, abundance of caution. And if, if everybody does what we're supposed to do, we'll get through this. We just have to keep, keep doing what we're doing, you know. And, and look at it as, as how can I help protect somebody else? Not to worry about yourself as much as you worry about what you're going to be doing for everybody else by not having a facial mask or a covering. Very good. Lisa, can you talk about facial coverings for the public for the most yeah. part? I mean, Pembroke sure. residents are listening. They're hearing this. They're getting their signals from the governor's update and from yep. other updates. And what can you say about that? So the importance of facial coverings, the chief just alluded very nicely to it. It isn't about protecting yourself. It's about protecting others. The, from, from day one to now, the quote unquote game has not changed. You to contract and pass COVID must expel liquids from your body and they have to get into someone else. 
And the method by which it does that is usually leaving your nose or your mouth and then going into someone else's nose, mouth, or potentially their eyes. So the idea of a facial covering is that it prevents that from happening. As you speak and you breathe, the facial covering would absorb and minimize any respiratory liquids that would be leaving your body and catch them. And that's the whole point. So for the average person, uh, a fabric facial covering, whether it be a scarf, a homemade mask, any of those things are all perfectly fine. So that's going to do twofold things. One, that's going to prevent you from expelling any liquids on others. And it's going to give you some minimal protection from airborne. Um, obviously, it's not as good as an N95. But one thing I'd, I'd like to say about the N95 and the procedural masks they are very similar. An N95 is a little bit better at droplet control, particulate control than a procedural mask, but a procedural mask is very close. The average person walking around does not need that level of protection. Keep in mind, these N95s and procedural masks, um, N95 is also used in the industrial sector, but when it comes to the medical sector, it is designed for someone of a profession to be around someone with an infectious disease and protect that individual. That's not what most people need. Um, secondly, if you use an N95 mask incorrectly, it's not going to do its job anyway. So you think you're buying yourself all this additional protection, you're not, and if you don't know how to use it, you're not. When I'm out in public and I see people with an N95 mask on, at least half the time they're wearing the mask incorrectly. So you're getting no value out of that very highly sought after resource <clears throat> by using it. You, you've basically wasted the resource. Um, procedural masks, on the other hand, are a lot easier to use. They're a lot more readily available. And if that makes you feel better, by all means, use that. But for the average person just going grocery shopping and everything else, a regular mask is just fine. The only thing I want to talk about with the facial coverings, whether they be homemade or any other kind, keep in mind, this is not a magical force field. This is not in place of social distancing, and this is not in place of hand washing. Keep in mind that most people that are contracting COVID are not because someone else has coughed or sneezed on them. It is likely because they have touched a surface that someone else um, has touched and has transferred bodily fluids, either from touching themselves or coughing in their hand or some other thing, transferred it to a surface. You come along and touch, touch that surface, and then you touch your face and you ingest the COVID. So that is the number one way of transport. It's not from coughing on one another, although that's totally possible too, of course. So washing your hands, we've said from day one, none of that's changed. Not getting someone else's bodily fluids into you, the best way to safeguard that is to stay six feet away from them. And the best way to avoid being exposed to anybody is to stay away from everybody. And I know a lot of people are also still from day one bogged down in the who's positive and where have they been. There are so many people walking around positive that we have not tested that may not even be symptomatic, <clears throat> that it is borderline irrelevant to know if someone's positive unless you've had direct physical contact with them, which for at least three weeks right now, we should not be having direct physical contact with anyone that doesn't live in our own home. And unfortunately, we are seeing for those that unfortunately have someone that's positive within their home. Yes, we are pretty much seeing that travel throughout the home. We have, we have several cases where that that's become the case. Um, but I think most families that have young children or anyone else know that when they bring home a germ from school, that's the way it's going to go. And that's what we're seeing with this as well. Thank you. Um, regarding the public health sector and how it's being managed. Uh, we've gotten some very good information, good updates. Thank uh, Josh Cutler for his update in the middle of the Tuesday broadcast about some of these testing sites and the more readily available testing while not perfect getting better every day, right? So question for you about the public health nurses. Can you demystify that a little bit for us? What is a public health nurse? What is it that they do? And how do they follow up on these cases? Sure. So... Public health nurses and public health in general is the backbone of all disease surveillance. These people work tirelessly. Um, I will tell you there's probably not a lot of people putting in more hours a day right now than your infectious disease control people. Um, public health nurses, of which most towns don't have enough. I know several towns are, are already short-staffed. We have three nurses on, and we're looking to add a fourth. Um, we're looking to even add people beyond that. Uh, many communities, I'm sure Josh can allude to this too, have, have started using uh, medical students and disease surveillance students to help with this follow-up. So what's going to happen is, let's say someone takes a COVID test and it does come up positive. What's going to happen? Mm -hmm. The hope is their primary or whoever that, that directed them to take that test is going to contact them first. But we're finding that's not always the case. 
When that test is confirmed in the state lab, the state lab goes ahead and uploads that information into MAVEN. I've made uh, allusions to MAVEN several times. It's the Inve Infectious Disease Surveillance Program um, set up by the state. They're gonna load that case onto MAVEN. Our public health nurses are checking MAVEN, I'm gonna guess every two hours at the minimum, sometimes even more. They're gonna log on, they're gonna see that new case. They're going to reach out to that person with the contact information that we hope is accurate inside of MAVEN. They're gonna to talk to that person. They're gonna, like I said, do a, a phone intake, if you wanna call it that. It can be anywhere from a half an hour to an hour long conversation about what they need to do, who they need to notify, um, what kind of steps are next for that individual. Right now, we are maintaining an every day or every other day contact with those individuals as the numbers spike. I think that contact, unfortunately, is going to have to drop to every three or four days. Um, hopefully, that individual um, rides out their COVID symptoms throughout the course of their 14-day cycle. And, and you know, a few days after becoming symptomatic, they are, they are starting to recover. And that by 14 days, they will have uh, passed the COVID through. They will come out on the other side, and they will be able to be out of their quarantine so it starts with the, the initial positive. It starts with a 14-day quarantine. Hopefully that individual doesn't require any other medical treatment. Obviously, if they do, they're going to receive that. But our experience is most do not. Most are recovering just fine on their own. Um, and then after that time period's lapsed, it's, it's safe for them to go out into the public again, which again, one of those, those awesome public health nurses will go ahead and, and let them know that. Okay, Representative Cutler, are you hearing from other communities that they also are running into a shortage in the public nurse, you know, public health, public staffing in the background, infectious disease control, and our students coming forward, and and how does that look? How does that look in the surrounding communities as well? Uh, good morning, thanks, Sabrina. Thanks for having us back again. Um, so yeah, no, um, I, the governor through an executive order uh, previously had um, allowed you know third year medical students and others to to make it easier to get medical certification, also bringing out retired physicians who are in good standing, allowing them to make their licenses current again. So it's taken a number of steps to, to increase the availability of medical professionals. Obviously, it's probably not enough yet, but we're still, you know, we're still make, certainly making progress. And um, Lisa, you know, spoken to that very aptly. Um, I wanted to just touch on a couple of things if I could. Uh, one is to give a nice little update from our last uh, session on Tuesday. We had a gentleman, I believe, who called in about needing a computer to get uh, one of the tracing jobs. And we were able to find a computer for him. So he will be getting that hopefully uh, today or tomorrow. So that was a nice little story. So thank you, PAC TV, for making that happen. Um, that was nice. Thanks for the generosity of folks. Um, wanted to just mention a couple of things, if I could. Um, the governor, um, obviously, Lisa touched on the new grocery store directive. The governor also yesterday announced um, $800 million in funding for our uh, for healthcare industry, especially for uh, $400 million of it to go to our hospitals. And obviously, you know they're uh, they're having sort of a double whammy here. One is um, the 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 ending of uh, elective surgery, which is usually what pays the bills for most hospitals, coupled with the influx of, of COVID nineteen cases, is really putting them in a pinch. So, providing a four hundred million dollar uh, injection of, of of capital to our hospitals, eighty million dollars for nursing nursing facilities. We know that they have come under um, under attack from COVID nineteen, and three hundred million dollars for uh, day have programs. Uh, home care health centers and such. So that will be uh, some much needed funds to help support our, our healthcare system. Um, the other thing I want to mention is because we have our, with Chief Wall and, and Chief, uh, sorry, Deputy Chief uh, Ken there is um, the governor filed legislation yesterday to uh, extend liability protection to all of our first responders and healthcare professionals. Obviously, if they're acting in good faith, trying to help people, we don't, the last thing they want to be worrying about is getting sued later on. So uh, that legislation was filed yesterday and I'm, I'm sure that that will find uh, broad support. Um, you mentioned the testing. Obviously, we have, I know the chiefs are already uh, aware of this. We have the testing facility for first responders in Foxborough, which is up. And there's a second one out in Western Mass at the Big E, which is a little far from here, but the Foxborough is not so far. And that is for uh, first responders. And as we announced before, there is a, um, a testing site at CVS and Lowell, which offers on-site results um, uh, you know, on the, within a half an hour. And there is a, um, an appointment form on their website. Um, so that's some of the, the news, uh, and then also the, the governor announced uh, we do have um, a nursing home hotline for any family members who have questions or concerns about about their a ner local nursing home. There's a hotline number that they can call. I'll read it off right now. It's six one seven six six zero five three nine nine. So those are some of the things that have happened since two just since Tuesday. <laughs>
And out of curiosity, do you know, is the CVS uh, call up, get on the uh, appointment schedule and um, head over for uh, an instant result test? Is that available to the public? Can anyone go online and request it? Yeah, it is, Sabrina. So you go to cvs.com and you can see the prompt right away. And what it will ask you is if, if you have a recommendation from a medical professional, then you can make the appointment. If you do not, there's going to ask you a series of questions. And if you um, show any symptoms, you fall into any of these sort of high risk categories, such as uh, being a first responder, being a healthcare worker, uh, living in a, a long term care facility, uh, a few other scenarios such as that. If you fall into any of those categories, then you can get the appointment as well. So if you are showing any symptoms at all um, and, and, and fall into one of those categories, then you can make an appointment for the same day test and you literally go up there and you'll get the results in, in, in half an hour, they say. And uh, by the way, there's no cost for that either. Really? <laughs> well done. To, to the consumer. Someone's paying. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very good. Um, back around, um, Chief. Uh, Chief Wall, what kinds of activities are you looking to see curtailed in the next two weeks? I mean, there's a possibility that the governor will come forward in the next few days and really um, define and narrow the lane for people at home over these next couple of weeks as we get ready for what could be a peak of reported cases as symptomatic, asymptomatic people start to display their own symptoms and, and rely on the healthcare system. What kinds of activities do you wanna see people reduce and what kind of calls <laughs> would the police department like to see potentially put off for another day if they're not urgent? Well, I, I think you just hit it. If they're not urgent, then uh, we're either gonna try and do them over the telephone or we're gonna come back later. Um, some of the things, again, is social distancing. We have a lot of nice parks. We have a lot of nice places, open space for people to get out in, but you gotta get out in them and be away from people. Um, I know the Herring are running right now, and while they can congregate in groups of hundreds and thousands, and hopefully we get a lot, our people still need to be six feet apart. We don't want to have to go close those like a lot of other communities are doing. They're closing parks, they're closing recreation areas, they're putting curfews on at night in the city of Boston. We don't want to have to do that, and we won't have to do that if people just use their, you know, common sense. And if it's crowded, go somewhere else. Just, just don't be in a crowded situation. Don't be that person because we don't want to have to force any of the issues. We want people to comply because it's the right thing to do. And as a follow-up to that, some of these decisions that are being made by the Pembroke Emergency Management Team are made in this daily uh, briefing and update, right, where everybody gets together, all the stakeholders are talking. And as the co-director and one of the founders of the current incarnation of FEMA, can you demystify that meeting a little bit for everybody who may be watching? What kinds of things happen? What kind of spirit are you seeing in terms of teamwork? And how do you come to some of those decisions where you take the actual events that are happening in Pembroke and then make these decisions going forward? Well, so a lot of the department heads in town, uh, a lot of the decision makers are part of FEMA. That's that's how it works. And uh, every day between 10 and 12 of us get together, sitting in a large room, all spaced out apart in our own particular chairs to talk about what we need to do, where are we going forward? What happened yesterday? How do we react to it today? And how do we move forward for tomorrow? Um, again, we're trying to keep these decisions as practical as possible, as up to date as possible, and uh, not to be, you know, just just put it out there. We don't want martial law. We just want people to comply with what we're trying to put out there for the general good of everybody. Um, it's a great team. Yeah, it's it's the fact that everybody still wants to meet every single day because things change day to day to day. Um, is important. And, and again, they have the best interest of the town of Pembroke and the residents of the town of Pembroke in mind. And again, if people just follow the suggestions that we're putting out there, then we don't have to make them orders. Oh, that's excellent. Um, Deputy Chief, as far as teamwork making this all happen and um, the drivers being public safety and the health agent in a health, you know, a health emergency, um, how has there been any discussion yet of the potential for tightening up if DPH or the governor start to really um, close down some of their advisories to orders? Has there been any conversation on the mechanics of that? Is it too soon to have that conversation? Do you think there's anything we could do to head that off? 
I think, that, like again, I think the Pima team has, with the board of selectmen and the health agent and, and yourself and Ed, I think we've we've got a plan for just about everything that's going to happen. We just have to wait for it to happen. Uh, so if the governor's going to tighten up some of those things, we'll do our ten o'clock meeting. We'll figure out how to, we're going to tighten those up to make that as less conducive to the public as we possibly can, but to kind of make sure that we really mean it. Like I said before, they put a lot of commitment and time and energy and a lot of financial things into doing what we've asked them to do. It would be awful if we screwed that up over the next couple of days or over a good weekend and we have to go out another four or five weeks. So we just need to suck it up for a little bit longer, do what we're doing, and, and I think we're going to be okay. But yeah, the Pima team has a has a plan in place for just about anything that uh, the governor is going to ask us to do. Thank you. Selectman Trabuco, you're still here, and I wanted to bring you in at this point because you've sit, sat in on some of these meetings. What are your observations of the team, and uh, what did you what did you see, and what did you like? So, Sabrina, everyone in the town of Pembroke should realize that we have a, a terrific team uh, running, uh, running Pima, uh, Board of Health, Police Department, Fire Department, uh, and, of course, Town Hall, all involved and working together as a team. And, uh, and they, this same team has been together for many years, uh, whether it be a storm all the way back in, for Nemo, for instance, and, and this event here. Uh, so th this team is used to working together. Uh, they're, they're competent and, uh, and they're effective. So the town of Pembroke should realize that um, we have the people in place to, to help the community move forward as best we can. Very good. What would you like to see as an outcome here, Dan? I know that you can't you know, read tea leaves and none of us can predict an outcome, but for residents at home who are taking their cues from what they see and what they read mm -hmm. and what they hear, what do you want to see people take away as positives from this if there is a way to focus on that at this point? So there's a, a, you know, a takeaway is there's a place to go to get real information. Uh, you know, social media is a place people go to looking for, for information, but it's not always accurate. So the information that's uh, put forth from, uh, from Pima uh, and, uh, and of course, Representative Josh Cutler is very helpful in this too, uh, giving people the resources of where to go to, what websites to actually visit. Uh, you know, federal, state, town websites are where you go to get the information. Uh, you're not going to get accurate information in Facebook all the time. That's true. Lisa, I understand that we have a couple of questions and I was hoping that before we get right into that, you could do a very quick, um, what kinds of support is the health department giving to local health centers, um, local area hospitals, group homes, medical facilities? Sure, so it's not just us. Um, every controlled facility, whether it be a hospital and assisted care living or whatever else, they, they also have their own oversight infrastructure with the state as well. Um, but the number thing, one thing that health department is trying to work with the directors of these types of facilities is when they have questions, trying to update them. Sometimes it's as simple as they're reporting problems that are occurring at their facility so that there's a continuity of information um, between them, us and the state, which is helpful because um, no conduit of information is 100% accurate 100% of the time. So it's kind of a double down of uh, tracking this information. Um, there's a lot of sharing of ideas. There's a lot of recommendations. Um, we actually shipped a whole bunch of procedural masks over to Pembroke Hospital yesterday because they were running short. So there's a sharing of resources, um, which is wonderful too. I know we sent um, a bunch of PPE over to New England Villages. Uh, Chiefs, correct me if I'm wrong, five or six days ago, we sent a bunch of equipment over there because they did not have enough. Um, so it's a physical support. It's a, an informational support. and and I bring it up every time, but I'll bring it up again. Um, my buddy Cole at Josh Cutler's office, when I really get stuck with a out of the gate question um, and my channels of resources of information have broken down or I'm not getting an answer quick enough, I don't know how Cole does it. I frankly don't care. I, I don't know if uh, he went to Hogwarts, so he has a, a magic spell to get this information, but nine times out of 10, he's getting any gray area questions that I can't get a straight answer on in 
I don't know, four hours about maybe even less. So that's the kind of thing we're doing. It's a lot of information sharing, a little bit of equipment sharing, and a lot of idea sharing to help make sure that those facilities that have a vulnerable population are, are able to serve those folks the best they can. Thank you. And we get questions during these forums that are emailed in, texted in, called in. And uh, we've deferred to Julie when that happens. Julie, do you have any questions today? Yes, actually, we have quite a few. Um, one that came in after uh, Tuesday afternoon, after you did last week's, uh, I mean, uh, Tuesdays, was about the property taxes. Are they still going to be due on May 1st? <laughs> That actually is something that has been under discussion this week, but it's a collaborative effort between the town manager, the treasurer collector, the chief assessor, and the town accountant. That finance team is getting together. They had some lengthy conversation yesterday. I know they're going to be continuing it today and hopefully have an answer by the end of the week. But um, Josh, can you talk a little bit about to what, what the governor passed in terms of what's allowed now versus the May 1st deadline? Sorry, I muted myself. Um, so yeah, uh, the governor did, uh, actually I'm sorry, the legislature had passed and the governor signed uh, the Municipal Flexibility Act for lack of a better term. And that did include provisions that uh, would give um, cities and towns more flexibility in terms of if they wanted to, to postpone or delay their property tax payment deadline. So that's really, you know, every municipality is different. They have different needs. And obviously you guys have to pay the bills too. So that's a consideration that has to be made, but um, that was uh, that did take effect. So there is some flexibility there for those kind of deadlines, along with, and, and I know Dan, I believe they had a meeting on this this week, uh, along with some flexibility for setting town election dates and town meeting dates, which I believe have now been uh, set for the new dates. So some tools to help our towns. Um, obviously, probably going to need some more tools as we learn, uh, but uh, so those are some of the steps that have been taken already. Uh, great. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Dan Tarugo, another question came in about for people that didn't um, see the selectmen's meeting this week, uh, town meeting and town elections, is there a new date set? So, yes, Julie, thanks for asking. Uh, Board of Selectmen on Tuesday voted to change the town meeting date to Tuesday, June 16th, and town election the following Saturday, Saturday, June 20th. So town meeting now will be June 16th, and the town election has moved to June 20th. That's about as far as we like to go comfortably at this point. Uh, we still want to maintain um, all the town business for this fiscal year uh, to get done prior to the next one, which begins July 1. Uh, so I think that those dates right there give us the pushback as far away as possible so that we can get over the, the, the coronavirus uh, episode uh, and then have a safe town meeting. And I'm sure there'll be uh, health and safety considerations at town meeting put in place, uh, social distancing the best we can with, um, uh, you know, hopefully the 200 plus people that, that show up. Uh, but Tuesday, June 16th in the evening and Saturday, June 20th is the election. So um, following up on the election date, Josh, maybe you can answer this. Is that the same date that will be used for the Senate? That, that Senate seat that's open, or is that different? No, that's May uh, 16th, Tuesday, May 16th. Is that the right date? Um, that's, it's going to be a different day. That was a, a, Senate, a special Senate election. Yes. That was the state Senate that just chose. Um, they have control over their elections. Obviously, in the House, it's different. Um, so they chose that date um, for the, the special election to, to fill the seat from former Senator DiMacito. So that'll be May, and I'm, I say May 16th. Let me just double check my calendar, make sure I'm not giving bad information. Um, so Sabrina, does that mean that May 19th, May 19th, May 19th. The 19th. Okay. Thanks. So does <laughs> that mean that, um, that will most likely be done via absentee ballot for the town of Pembroke? Yes, but the clerk has already been taking in significant volume of absentee ballot. She's continuing to recommend that residents in Pembroke explore this opportunity. Um, concern about illness is a viable reason to request an absentee ballot. I think a lot of that's been um, relaxed to accommodate our seniors and folks who don't want to come out to the polls. Um, and she has uh, been outside a town hall for the requests she's allowing people to download the form online and email it back, and then she mails out the absentee ballot. It is a strong and democratic way in a pandemic to exercise your right to vote. And uh, the town clerk in Pembroke is really um, 
suggesting heavily and recommending people do explore that opportunity. And it brings fewer bodies into the polls on actual election day. And of course, the workers are there and uh, she tries to minimize the staff and, uh, you know, bring in the police officers she needs to escort the boxes. But it still reduces how many people can come in and vote at one time. Uh, she did explore with the Board of Selectmen and Ms. Selectman Trabuco can talk to this about consolidating precincts for this particular election so there were fewer locations, fewer um, staff needed to support and stand up, fewer precincts. And um, that was a good conversation and the selectmen voted to support her in that. Um, Dan, do you have anything more to say on that? Sure, so uh, uh, Pat, Peg came, came up to the Board of Selectmen uh, with a request that the town of Pembroke use one voting location uh, to, to minimize uh, to minimize staff, to minimize the, the, the spread of coronavirus, really. So she wanted to do one location, which would be town hall, because that's where her, her computer is. Uh, if there's any question, uh, you've heard of folks coming into uh, the election and having trouble with their with the registration. Well, if, if uh, Peg has the ability to be right at her computer, um, it's it, it's just more helpful for her. So the Board of Selectmen have decided that Town Hall will be the single voting location. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dan. Also, I just wanted everyone to know that the Pembroke website, and I have it, if we could bring it up, um, Control Room, thank you, is, is a great resource. And we were talking about where do you get your information. Um, Lisa, I assume that this is updated, and I'm, I'm going to click on the, the uh, red banner that has your um, now, this was updated last night because today's uh, Thursday morning. So is this updated, Lisa, every single day with, with whatever we need for the most recent information? Yes, ma'am. So every day um, between noon and two, we can't give you an exact time because sometimes the information changes quickly. <laughs> but between noon and two, we take the daily update and we upload it there. There's one thing I do want to point out about the daily update. We're always going to be a day behind the state because obviously we can't necessarily update instantaneously. And the other thing I want to point out about Maven, a lot of people are case counting and saying, well, it was two this day and four that day and one that day. Keep in mind, there's also a window of update on Maven. So when you're seeing this information, if you see zero cases one day and four the next, that doesn't mean there was a one single cluster of four or anything else. That just means when we went through our update cycle, there were four. Chances are it was out, probably spread out over the two days. Um, and chances are that, that it was just a matter of when that, if, if you want to call it data upload was cut off, you know, timing wise. Um, but yes, the information there is going to be accurate within 24 hours of whatever's going on in the world. So that's what the, the, the cycle we're on right now is 24. It was much longer before. I'm hoping that the cycle gets a lot better. Um, but with, as the volume of cases go up, that too could have an impact on how rapidly that can be updated. Great. Thank you. And before I forget to mention this, we, we get for all of our towns, we do these for all of our towns, a huge amount of questions about unemployment and about um, loans and business, how we can help business. Josh Cutler has um, coordinated a really great uh, forum that we're doing tomorrow afternoon at 1.30, um, which is all about kind of the it's economics and it's business development and it's, it's helping employees. And he's going to have a number of different um, people on that show. Josh, you want to just talk about that for a minute? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Julie. Um, so, and, and by, by way of update, I know, cause I, I got, this is the number one question um, uh, self-employment, self-employed folks, independent contractors, we're waiting on the final ready, set, go for unemployment here in Massachusetts for folks who fall into those categories. Governor Baker um, yesterday said that he expected that to be up this week. So that's good news. Today's Thursday. So, you know, to me, that would mean by tomorrow. Now, keep your fingers crossed. As always, could be some last minute delays, but I think we're getting really close to being able to offer that benefit for folks who, you know, so, so many people I know in, in our, in Pembroke, in our South Shore region fall, you know, fall into the self-employed or independent contractor. So that would be a huge help. Uh, but yeah, so tomorrow, Friday, 1.30 p.m., we're doing a, a, a forum just like this. Again, I want to give a great plug to PAC TV. Wouldn't build a, all this good stuff without you guys. Um, and uh, we'll bring in some different folks, some of my colleagues in the legislature and um, some business folks to talk about specifically about the Paycheck Protection Program, the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, um, some of the other options that are out there if you're a small business owner, if you're, you're self-employed, if you're an independent contractor, if you're unemployed, 
if you've had to, to leave work for, for health reasons. Um, some of the different options that are there. There's a lot of good stuff in the CARES Act that was passed by Congress. And um, that's all happening kind of fast and furious. Banks are now starting to lend on the, the Paycheck Protection Program. So we're going to do a forum uh, tomorrow just focused on those topics. And we invite folks to uh, email in questions uh, either during the show or even better ahead of time. Uh, uh, and I know Julie can give out that email address. And um, so look forward to that. And thanks for the thanks for the tease. <laughs> Sure. Yes. And anything for that, um, any questions for that economic forum um, can be emailed to um, DuxburyInfo at PACTV.org. That's DuxburyInfo at PACTV.org because that is going to be um, through a few of the other people that are represent Duxbury. I had one other question and it's actually for Lisa Cullity. There's a lot of question about people that are considered um, essential businesses like for example, we at PAC TV are considered an essential business because we're a TV or a radio station, and we're be able to do this for you. So every day I leave my house in Pembroke and I come down to Plymouth and I'm here for you know eight, nine, ten hours, and then I go home and I actually social distance from my mother-in-law who lives with me, um, and from actually even from my husband. I keep the six feet because I am around people all day. Even though we wear masks at at work, we're obviously not just staying home. Can you? recommend that or, or talk about people that do have to go out into the workplace um, when they get home what they should do? Absolutely. Um, and I get asked that question a lot. And I give the, the same advice that I've given to our, our police officers, our firefighters, and anyone else. If you've been out on shift doing whatever you're doing, the, the good news about this bug is soap and water kills it. Um, if I've been around a lot of people, I'm going to go home and take a shower first thing. Why not? Um, I'm going to take off, you know, all my clothing, make sure that goes right into the washer and dryer. That kills it. Um, this is not a tough bug to beat. It's just easy to transfer. So it sounds overly simplistic, but hygiene matters so much. One of the few things I do read online that concerns me a lot, and, and I know a lot of it's just jokes, but the jokes of I just changed from my night PJs to my day PJs, or I'm not going to take off my PJs all day, ha, ha, ha. I would stress, even if you're in your house, maintaining good hygiene, if, even if there's you know someone that's else in the house that's gone in and out, they could have brought, quote, unquote, the bug back to you. So you you don't want to fall into that lack of washing um, mm -hmm. or anything else, because this, this bug is so easily disposed of, dispatched by washing, by soap and water, that I would encourage everyone, encourage everyone to, to soap and wash more. And Julie, just so you know, I, I have my house set up in a way, and this is something <clears> I've mentioned to some of the construction guys, because it's very tough to main, maintain hygiene um, when you're working on a, a construction type job. So if you have the ability to enter your home through a laundry room or enter your home through a basement where the laundry might be and kind of ungear, I know that we're going to get a little interesting here, but to get rid of all those clothes, get them right into the washer and then move expeditiously right to the nearest shower and, and take a shower and get all clean, nice, hot, soapy water, um, you're going to minimize the opportunity for you to have transferred that bug in with you. Obviously, masks and social distancing are always great. Obviously, those people that are carrying it home um, for a loved one that might be in that population that could be more affected, if you can maintain social distance from that person, even better. Um, but again, this is kind of easy to, to wash away, and you should be doing that if you can, if it's feasible. Obviously, not every situation is feasible, and obviously, social distancing is always the best. But I know in some caregiving situations, hands-on care is just part of it. it. It's necessary. Excellent. Thank you. That was, that was a perfect answer to that question. I had one more that just came through. Um, a gentleman says, uh, can you clarify how to access volunteer opportunities on the website? I tried to find it, and I couldn't. Who wants to take that? I, I don't mind. So right now we don't have a lot of volunteer opportunities. We suspect within the next, I don't know, three to four days, what we might be looking for is for some people to bring some, some food goods and drop them off to those that might be stuck in a home uh, for multiple reasons. Either they can't go out, they shouldn't go out because of their own medical situation. So if we have bags of groceries that can be delivered that might be something that would be a really good opportunity for the average person to do safely um obviously if you're medical personnel completely different if if you are someone that's a, a lpn or an rn and if you're looking to help out with disease surveillance that would be an awesome help unfortunately most of the people with those types of credentials um 
probably already have jobs in the medical facilities and we totally respect that you're probably already working 12, 16 hour days at minimum. Um, but but the, the Meals on Wheels and the assistance with, with delivering food items to those that can't or shouldn't go out is an opportunity we see that might be coming. If you are someone that is handy and crafty and you're making some of those fabric masks and you're willing to sell or pass them out to your neighbors and friends, that's an awesome thing you can do. Um, any kind of face covering that can be constructed. But I, I want to remind people, you don't have to have a sewn mask to have a good face covering. I saw a lady in the supermarket the other day with a absolutely beautiful scarf that she had just triple wrapped covering her nose all the way down through her chin and it was the most beautiful scarf i was very jealous and she looked fantastic and she was completely covered um for any uh chance to to expose anyone else to her own um breathing and everything else which was which was absolutely awesome so um certainly someone with a surplus of scarves if they were to wash those and allow those to be handed out to those that might not have a surplus of those items that would be really nice of them too excellent um, Sabrina, I don't know if you have any um, last words, if anybody around the table wants to, um, around the group, uh, wants to give any final thoughts based on what was heard today. And I was going to say, Julie, just to add on to that before everybody goes, and I'm really interested in grabbing the chief and deputy chief first. Um, you have this opportunity and won't have it again for a week. What are the things you really want to reinforce going into the next seven days, Chief Wall? Well, if you want to volunteer, volunteer to stay home. You know, volunteer if you go shopping to shop for somebody else. Cut down the number of people in the store. You know, that, that's a 50% reduction right there. That's good idea. Those are the things you can do. Just ride this out, stay home, and keep the personal hygiene going. Keep the social distance going if you have to get out. But, but make it a have to, not a want to. And I realize everybody's been home for a couple of weeks. But, you know, we're going to get through this. It just would be better if we didn't make it worse first. Deputy Chief? Uh, yeah, I agree with uh, the Chief. Um, also, um, as we're going to start to ramp up the calls, as, they, as they're telling us, that we're, we're going to just make sure when you call 911 that you give the dispatcher there exactly what the issue is, exactly what your symptoms are, so that we can prepare our crews on the way there. Um, and again, don't, don't hesitate to call. I've noticed lately that people are... are holding off on calling because they don't want to go to the hospital and everybody we're taking is truly sick and probably should have went a little earlier. Um, and I got, I got the whole reason why they don't want to go to the hospital, but it doesn't do you any good to sit home and suffer. So just if, if things aren't right and you need to go to the hospital, just call us. We're going to come like we always do. Just kind of give us a heads up for what the issue is. Into Ken's, into the deputy chief's point, Sabrina. Yes. While you're waiting for the police and fire to show up, put on your face coverings very good very good all right so as we come to a close for the week lisa you have one more chance to get out in front of everybody till next week what do you have to say sure i'm going to steal ken's line from the other show don't mess it up people have sacrificed so much jobs have been sacrificed money has been sacrificed socialization has been sacrificed birthday parties you name it everyone has sacrificed so much up to this moment don't go out and congregate and be around other people unless you absolutely have to, because this still could be all this good and all this sacrifice can be completely undone by the irresponsibility of just a few people. If you don't have to go out and congregate, don't go and make those those trips outside your home. Absolutely necessary. But that doesn't mean you have to be shut in. I, I hear so many people going, but I have to get out. I'm going stir crazy. Get out. Go for a walk by yourself or with just your family. Um, don't go congregate at a park. There are literally hundreds of acres of walkable trails and land in this town to enjoy. If you pull up to one and there's more than 10 cars there, keep driving. Find another one. The town forest has been empty. I live right down the street from the town forest. I have not seen more than one car there in a long time. Please just drive around. Even the cranberry bogs off of Elmer Street and other streets, they're owned by the town. Foot traffic is welcome there. You could have at least 100 people walking around those bogs and never even bump into each other. So don't congregate in parks like Ludham's Ford, the, the Herring Run, and other places. I'm begging everyone at home, don't force us to close those facilities. We were already forced to close the recycling center due to the behaviors there that put people at risk. Please don't make us take anything else away. We don't want to. Thank you, Lisa. Very well done. 
And uh, Julie, I'd want to take a minute to not only thank everyone who came out today, I really do appreciate you coming out and updating the presidents of Pembroke. They care. They're leaving messages. They're talking about it online. They're grateful for the opportunity to get the information straight from the people that they should be getting it from. But I also want to thank PAC TV for hosting these forums. Julie, well done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabrina. And did either Dan or um, Josh have any parting comments until we see you um, a week from now? Yeah, sure. I just wanted to mention one thing I didn't get a chance to mention earlier uh, for folks. I know health insurance is a big concern for many individuals, and um, especially if you're you know, recently unemployed. Um, so the, the Mass Health Connector has extended its open enrollment deadline to uh, May 25th. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would encourage folks who are looking at health insurance as a concern, uh, including Mass Health, to go to the Mass Health Connector website and you can plug in your information and see what kind of plans are available and see if you qualify for Mass Health. So the mahealthconnector.com. That's great. And Dan Taruco, any last words? Yes, absolutely, Julie. <clears throat> it's just important for the public to know that uh, Town of Pembroke Municipal Government is up operating. Uh, you see just from this form alone that the essential services, police, fire, and health are, are all up and running and organized, uh, but the, the everyday services at uh, Pembroke Town Hall is up and running. Many folks are working from home and social distancing uh, uh, to enter Town Hall for regular business. Uh, we're not allowing that right now, but you can you can call Town Hall if you have, have an issue. Town Hall is open, uh, and even if some of the people are, are working from home, uh, municipal government is operating, and, uh, and the folks are getting paid. So uh, that's one thing that's important for the morale of, uh, of, of the people that are working at Town Hall and providing these services. But for the taxpayer also, you, sh you should know that uh, the Mass DOR, Division of Local Services, has a disaster declaration to uh, reimburse the town of Pembroke. So um, it's, it's, it's good for the workers to understand that they, they have a steady, steady, stable job. And it's good for the taxpayers to know that eventually the town will be made whole for that. Thank you, Dan. That was so well put, and, and I think that needed to be said and needed to be heard. Thank you very much for that, and thank you for joining us. Please do note that every time we have one of these forums, we date stamp it on the screen. The entire time you're watching it, it'll have the date that it was recorded. Because things change so quickly, uh, we want to make sure that you're aware that that was the date that the information you're hearing was valid. It might be very different next week. So again, every Tuesday and Thursday at 9 o'clock, please do join in Comcast Channel 15 or go to our website and hit um, pactv.org slash live. We also have these on replay, pactv.org slash Pembroke. Thank you so much for joining us. Please stay safe, social distance, keep the faith, keep positive, and we will get through this together.